And joining us now on the debate in the nation's capital, Mazen Schwab, former executive director of the National Council on Canada Arab Relations. And back here in studio, Randall Hansen, Canada Research Chair in Immigration and Governance at the University of Toronto, Anna Kortevich, Sociology Professor at the University of Toronto, and Michael Corrin, author of As I See It and the host of his eponymously named television program on CTS. Good to have everybody around the table here. Mazen, good to have you on the line again from the nation's capital. It's been a long time. Thank good you. to see you, my friend. Good to see you. Let me, well, I guess we've invited you all here today because there have been uh, an increasing number of incidents highlighting tensions between Muslims and various Western European nations. And to that end, I want to read something here from the BBC News and then we'll chat. Michael, if you would, first graphic. In 2004, uh, filmmaker Theo van Gogh is murdered by a Dutch-born Muslim after making a film about Islamic oppression of women. January 2009, Dutch Freedom Party leader Geert Wilders charged with inciting hatred after calling for a ban of the Koran. 2005, the Danish newspaper Jyllands Postens publishes cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad, an act considered blasphemous to many Muslims. Additionally, some of the cartoons portrayed Muhammad in an unflattering light. We all remember the protests, the rioting around the world. Dozens of people were killed. Cartoonist Kurt Vestergaard remains in hiding after an attempt on his life last month. June 2009, French President Nicolas Sarkozy proposes a ban on women wearing burqas in public. December 2009, a Swiss referendum brings about a ban on the construction of any new minarets in that country. Okay, let's unpack this a bit. Anna, to you first. It's easy to look at these various events and conclude that Europe is witnessing a growing wave of intolerance mm -hmm. towards Muslims. Do you believe that this is, in fact, the case? Um, yes and no. <laughs> okay, you're allowed to say that. Now tell me what you mean. So what I mean is that, um, on the one hand, if you read them like that, clearly there's a trend and it doesn't look good, right? On the other hand, when you do what I do and you go to Holland and you talk to people and you see people really trying to figure out what it means to live together in a way that is about dialogue and that is about um, struggling through complex issues, I would actually say there is, at the same time as there is a, a heightened kind of alarmist debate that draws on these kinds of images, there's also simultaneously processes unfolding that um, are about creating tolerance. And by that I mean tolerance as in the ability to live together despite being different. Okay, let's go, I'm gonna go around the horn here, get everybody on this. Mazen, why don't you give me your view on that? Sure, I, I obviously clearly, like Anna said, if, if you put them one after the other, there's a clear intolerance towards Muslims. But w the way I, I see it, I don't see it as directed only against Muslims. I see it as its historical background. If you look at the history of it, it this is, related to anti-immigration, anti-immigrants uh, in, in many of these uh, European countries. It's just now it's taking on Islamophobic tendencies because people, uh, the symbolism of Islam is quite, quite present and especially since September uh, 2001, uh, we're seeing it as direct against Muslims. But I would say that the same feelings or the same issues that are facing the Muslims are facing Africans in, in most of these European countries as well and other immigrant communities. Michael? Um, my family uh, were immigrants to the UK uh, from Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. uh, Jews, and um, <laughs> I, it, I'm incredulous actually, the idea that Europe is anti-immigrant. If there's anti-immigrant culture and a, and a fundamental notion of being an anti-immigrant state, we must look, I think, to, to much of the Islamic world where there's very little immigration at all. Europe has welcomed immigrants. The British example is a very good one to use because a whole group of people came in the 50s and 60s uh, from South Asia in particular. And if you juxtapose the, the Hindu, Sikh, and Muslim experience, it's very, very interesting, quite enlightening. Hindu and Sikh don't have to assimilate. Why should you have to assimilate? But fitted in, became part of British culture. Almost unheard of to see a, a Hindu or a Sikh in a British prison. Uh, enormous embouchement, large middle class, um, part of the, British, uh, the fabric of British society. Muslims who came at the same time, who faced the same racism, and there was racism, and, and the same opportunities, um, terrible crime problems, large prison population, political violence, extremism, and so on. Not everyone, of course. But we have to ask, what is different about South Asian Hindu, South Asian Sikh, and Sikhs face the worst racism because of the visibility, and South Asian Muslim? Well, I'm afraid it's not Islamophobia to say, well, perhaps religion is, is a different factor here. And 
I don't think the French people or the British people or the, or the Dutch or Scandinavians are anti-immigrant. On the contrary, I think they're pro-tolerance and diversity, and they're offended when a certain, a specific group says, we don't believe in that. Randall. Yeah, <coughs> I largely agree with Michael. I mean, if you want to make an argument about anti-immigration sentiment in Europe, you'd have to explain to me why it is that France, Britain, and Germany in the last 10 years, and I can talk about the Netherlands, have all opened the doors to, not, uh, to more immigrants, have expanded immigration uh, controls. And there's sort of notion out there that there were these Muslims quietly minding their own business, and then Europe, Euro Europeans decided to make lives difficult for them cannot be sustained. Now, one could say that Europeans overreacted, but not to not talk about 7-7, to not talk about Madrid. You did mention the murder of Van Gogh, which was a brutal act of Islamist violence. I mean, this is partly a reaction to these events. So I think there's evidence of tensions and problems, but to say this is a simple matter of European intolerance towards the other, that just doesn't work. Imagine you want to come back at that? Of course. I, if, if you go back and look at evidence, uh, Polish immigrants, Italian immigrants, Spanish immigrants who came to Europe in the 50s, 1950s, all experienced intolerance and, and, and all experienced violence of sorts. Uh, there's enough evidence of that. Uh, the issue, of, of course, mm -hmm. uh, the issue of Muslims, uh, you know, with the, with the political problems becoming religious problems and becoming, you know, uh, uh, part of the, uh, uh, the, the conflict uh, in, in Europe, this is adding fuel to the fire. I'm not, I'm not at all saying that Muslims are integrating well, but if you look at the numbers, for example, in terms of uh, numbers of, of uh, immigrants who are, uh, uh, you know, their education levels are, are half, if not less than half of what the education levels of the main population, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, lack of uh, jobs, 20% immigrants uh, are uh, jobless rates are across Europe almost 20% and more. Uh, of the immigrant population is, is uneducated. There are a lot of issues related to the policies of, uh, under which these immigrants are coming to, okay. to Europe. Michael wants to come back at you. I, I really sure. do, because mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd like to hear the evidence, by the way, for this violence against Poles and Italians that you mentioned. If you want to talk about um, violence, for example, and, and racism, to, we mentioned Poles in East Europe. The Jewish community, let's take Britain, or France, or Sweden. In Malmo, uh, what, is it the third city in Sweden, I'm not sure, uh, almost the entire Jewish community leaving now because of anti-Semitism. You think that's bl blonde-haired, blue-eyed Scandinavians? Every act, every single act has been from people identified with Islam. In the United Kingdom... Recently, King, yes, in, Michael, sorry, recently, if I know, yes, you, I made, you made these comments, and often people say, oh, they must be true. I'm, I'm sorry, the violence against Poles and Italians, of course people face racism. It's inevitable. There will always be some sort of people who but don't like others. It was like related others. to jobs however, and the economy, too. Ha however, today, in Britain, the rates of, of anti-Semitic attacks, almost unheard of in Britain, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, are now becoming appallingly high in various inner cities, and again, it's not the far right, it's young Muslims. Why are the host population being asked to, to deal with their own racism and Islamophobia when the divisions seem to come not from them but from other communities entirely? Let me go to Anna. Hang on one second, sure. Mason, because I want to get Anna into this as well. We're, we're, we're kind of having this debate a little bit in this country with the, the reasonable accommodation issues that have mm -hmm. come up in Quebec over the past number of years. Mm -hmm. Can you help us understand what you think European countries are doing to help accommodate and integrate Muslim immigrants into the broader society? Well, there's... Actually, I want to come back to something that Randall was saying, like people are open to immigration, and that's evidence of the fact that there is then, that that's, that's tolerance and that's openness across the board. I think what actually happens is that Europeans have a set of um, principles that they live by and, and truly believe in that have to do with equality and liberal values and liberal democratic values, but that when it comes to bringing those things into practice, we see consistently that there is, that there is there is discrimination in the labor market, that there are problems in education, streaming people through into higher education who are from a Muslim. And as Mazen said, actually, up until 10 years ago, we weren't talking about Muslims. We were talking about Turks and Moroccans, and mm. that it was ethnicity True. that has become religious-sized, and, and that's, a very, in, again, a very complex process. But there are consistent, um, I would say there's consistent evidence that while people are willing to put their principles, Europeans, whoever they are, by the way, uh, go European governments will put their principles out and will let people in based on those principles. What happens then <coughs> once people have entered? And the social processes that unfold definitely are processes that involve discrimination, 
that is systemic. Well, Hindu and Chinese? You, mm. you know, university yeah, yeah, population in the UK, for example. Yeah. Look at the, the Hindu population and Chinese mm -hmm. population. And you're, in fact, it's now overrepresented, as mm -hmm. Jews were. Mm -hmm. Now, there are many young Muslims at university, but part of the, of the resistance and reluctance to, mm -hmm. to be part of higher education in British culture is not coming from British people, some of whom are racist, of course, or from, or from French mm -hmm. or anyone else, mm -hmm. but from their communities themselves, who say, do not become part of what is essentially anti-Islamic. Or at least Michael, if, if I may, uh, Michael, I'm not disagreeing with you that there are problems within the Muslim community. It's, it's rifled problems. There are a lot of issues related to the issues of integration, accepting the, you know, liberal uh, values and all these factors that play into what, what we're seeing today in terms of the violence, the attacks on, uh, in, in, uh, in Europe and other places. Totally, I agree with you. I, myself, uh, this is, this is uh, something that I feel. When I get on an airplane, I fly every, every two weeks. I'm going to the Middle East and to Europe. Uh, regularly, I fly on an airplane. I see a Muslim reading a book, the Quran. I look at it and I start wondering what's going to happen. And and I'm a, I'm from a Muslim background, so let me let me make make this qualify this. Obviously, there are problems within the Muslim community. Obviously, there are issues within the Muslim community. But what what the fear that people are stoking against Muslims is not helping eliminate the problem and allowing Europeans to move on within a, a some sort of a multicultural. Uh, a policy framework that allows Muslims to be integrated, well integrated okay. into their communities, and not to just say we, want, we are a multicultural society, but create the policies and implement the policies that will allow people to become integrated. Because if, if you keep them disenfranchised, some people, and we're seeing this in the Middle East, those who are disenfranchised from the political system, from the social system, will ultimately, uh, some of them, not all, obviously we remember that we're talking about small minority here, uh, will lead to uh, uh, taking them into into violent behavior and and manifestation. Okay, Randall of their wants a response on this one. Yeah, yeah, no, I think I mean where we agree is on the um, on the importance of work and the fact that the majority or not majority but large numbers, 20 to 40 percent of Muslim communities in Europe are unemployed. We should be talking about that much more and much less about 20 these, to 40 percent. Yeah, depending on the neighborhood, That's depending on the number. country. That is huge. Uh, and we should be talking about that rather than these sort of symbolic cultural issues. So much of this conversation is a huge distraction. However, an uncomfortable truth that part of the problem with unemployment is it's partly valuing education, as Michael said, but it's partly a welfare state that offers benefit levels above the market wage in the context of a Muslim population, which is largely unskilled. In that context, that can lead to only one thing, which is unemployment. What I would also like to say, and I think there's some agreement between us here, is that uh, Europeans, again, whoever they are, themselves need to do something, but it's not multiculturalism they need. Multiculturalism is frankly what they have. Mm -hmm. You come to this country, be Turkish, be Moroccan, we don't think you're European anyway, live in your community, speak your language, go to your faith schools, live your own lives. What they need is quite the opposite, integration, a meaningful path for no. Moroccans to become French, Turks, German. But it's just multiculturalism? No, this is integration. It's quite the opposite. No, no, I'm, I'm talking about multiculturalism as they're practicing it in Europe. It's well, multi different than ours. Multiculturalism means a million things to a million different people in Canada. So well, it depends we, what you're talking about. I think about. we know what it means to a Turk living in Germany trying to you know, be a guest worker in that country. Right? It does, it, multiculturalism means something very different to that person than it does to somebody it, here. It keeps you as a second and third class citizen for possibly, a long time Possibly, in possibly, possibly. Well, yeah. Sorry, Michael. Germany, but Germany has a specific issue. Mm -hmm. The idea of guest star, but I think you're far more qualified than I am in this area. But people were brought in on a temporary basis to do the work that Germans did not want to do. Now, there, there are some Im implicit moral problems with that approach. Mm -hmm. Um, most of Europe took in people, come into our country and be part of, of our nation. There was seldom an insistence, maybe France is a little different, that mm. you had to be British or you had, you had to be Swedish. The French have always had this notion of what it means to be, to be French, which is not being English, not being Anglo-Saxon, not being American. Even with Huguenots, with French Protestants, are they completely French, although the country is secular? French Jews, an ambivalent position. With, with Islam, and I do have more of a sympathy for the Muslim community because they're living in, in these awful suburbs around some beautiful cities. Uh, they're allowed to shop in the local stores but not work in them. And it's not just Muslims, of course. There are non-Muslims, tend to be from ethnic minorities in those areas too. And when the rioting took place, it was almost inevitable. I saw it in Britain 10, 10 15 years before mm -hmm. that. But there is, there does seem to, be, seem to be a consistent issue with Islamic communities throughout Europe that doesn't apply to other immigrant groups. And that has to be addressed, and it's not Islamophobic to address it. Let me follow up with you on this, Michael, um, about whether or not special rights are appropriate in certain circumstances. And I think it was this past weekend when there was um, an Islamic leader, I wish I had a better description than that, but an mm -hmm. Islamic leader somewhere in Britain who said, for example, picking up on Mazen's issue about the airports, uh, full body scans, you know these new highfalutin machines that are coming in, full body scans 
for Muslims are inappropriate because they reveal too much and that raises a whole host of religious issues that are you know, very, very tricky with some of the Muslim community violating the Quran and so forth. Should there be an acknowledgement of a quote unquote special right for those Muslims who do not want to undergo those body scans because they think it violates their religious principles? The problem is, should there be a specific uh, right of anyone to say no if they, if they feel compromised? I mean, I, I feel sorry for the person having to look at me if they can see me naked. It would be a, an awful <laughs> thing to, to have to do. But we have um, something in common, Mike. Because <laughs> <laughs> the deep irony here is, uh, without even going close to the issues of racial profiling, because people aren't mentioning race, the idea of profiling who is a potential suspect in, a, in an airline bombing, obviously Islam is an issue. And the very people who are saying, no, we cannot go through these scanners, are people of the Muslim yeah. faith. I don't think this man speaks for all Muslims. Uh, quite a few of the people who are working there behind these scanners are of the Muslim faith, for goodness sake. So again, this is the vast majority of people want, want a, a peaceable working society. But look, if it hadn't been for various terrorist attacks and what is going on geopolitically, most people would say, give them whatever rights they want. A few people would object, but they wouldn't matter very much. It's because of the dynamic between Islam and the West. Anna, could I get you to address that issue of whether special rights are appropriate in these circumstances? You know, you're, it's such a loaded question when you phrase it that way, right? At this point, we've pretty much rejected, I think, across the board that, there, that special rights, they, they don't fly mm. anymore, as it were, in the European context. Um, what I think, though, what is important is to make sure that you give voice to people so that everybody can sit around the table. So what I've been noticing in the work that I do, and coming back to the question of integration, so when it comes to creating policies that, that enable people to fully participate in society, regardless of where they're from, it helps to have representatives of their community mm -hmm. around the table. And it helps to have them go back to their communities and create dialogue. Those things just help. Does that mean special rights? I, I mean, I, my sense is, like your example of, of the scanners, my, my sense is that there's other people who are gonna have trepidation about that, mm -hmm. and we can still frisk people. Mm -hmm. Like, if there's an easy solution, why not? Okay, right? let me try this That's with um, Mazen. Mazen, I'm gonna read you something that uh, Tarek Ramadan uh, published uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, Over the last two decades, Islam has become connected to so many controversial debates violence, extremism, freedom of speech, gender discrimination, and forced marriage, to name a few, it is difficult for ordinary citizens to embrace this new Muslim presence as a positive factor. That was published in the Christian Science Monitor in December. Can you react to that quote for me? Of course, but the problem is, is that you have uh, uh, people are mixing the, what is happening in the Muslim and the Arab world with what is happening in Europe and, and within these communities. There is no disconnect uh, or there is no separation being made between the two. And, and relatively speaking, the, the, or the problems that are happening in the, in the Middle East are being reflected also in these communities. So in people's minds, in the European mind or American mind or Canadian mind, they are one and the same. And this is where there, is need, there needs to be a, a level of, of dialogue and discussions. And, and for the community itself, it needs to be out there speaking about these issues and making those uh, uh, or, or making, making clear separation firewalls between what they're dealing with and what is going on around the world. Because when we talk about, for example, child marriages in, in Yemen at six, eight, ten years old girls getting married, this is not happening in Canada or in Europe. But these things are reflected on the community in Canada. And I think this level of ignorance, this level of uh, uh, or debate that needs to happen is not happening uh, at a level whereby people can, can understand the differences between the two. Okay, let me follow up with Randall then. Ramadan's quotation, if you take another interpretation of it, could also be read as trying to portray Muslims as kind of hapless bystanders in people's impressions of them. Somehow they're merely passive vessels to be filled by the misperceptions of the other. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that notion? Uh, well, no, clearly, I mean, that's not the case on, on a number of levels, partly because some of these uh, horrendous acts have been committed by uh, Muslims, but also more positively because there are actors uh, across Europe who are staking out counter positions, uh, members of the uh, German Muslim Council in Germany. Um, I'm tempted to say Tariq Ramadan, though um, I think we could debate that. He's possibly a moderate voice, possibly an extreme sure. voice. It depends on your point of view. Uh, but I think an important point that, that Mazan made is 
or we'll get at what he said, is within a European context, we shouldn't over-aggregate this category of Muslims either. I mean, when you're talking about the Turkish community in Germany, where there's a strong secular tradition, that's a very different dynamic. Kreuzberg is the most segregated neighborhood in Germany. It's a wonderfully integrated neighborhood, the sort of neighborhood that Richard Florida would love to live in. Mm -hmm. you know, gays, Turks, uh, white affluent Germans all mixing together. And again, the British community uh, is different from those two, and the one from which a lot of these problems emerge. So when we talk about Europe, often we're talking about Britain. Let me put another word out there that's not quite Europe, but close to Europe. Anna, mm -hmm. people talk today about Eurabia. What do they mean <laughs> when they say that? You know, I had to look it up for you. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't quite sure. Um, I think different things, again. Uh, one, one interpretation is that there is a concerted effort by Arabian uh, Arab governments to infiltrate Europe through mm. sending their population there. The other interpretation, I believe, is to uh, the, sh the demographic shifts that some people will predict, but more careful analyses of demography su suggest probably will not take place quite as dramatically by you know, the fact that immigrant families often have more children will create a difference in the population. Um, it's not a compliment, though, is it? It's not a compliment. No, I don't like the term, which is part of why I had to look it up. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> some terms I, 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 I actually, avoid. I actually think <laughs> Arabs are running away from their own governments. So this yeah. is what we're happy. <laughs> well, that's, uh, I, I mean, think, uh, this accurate. is ludicrous to <laughs> suggest, <laughs> well, to yeah, suggest that Arab governments have a plan. If the <laughs> Arab governments had a plan, they wouldn't be in this position. In the I don't yeah. think that's actually that's what, uh, what it does okay. mean, though. I mean, it, it's a specific concept coined by, uh, by, I think, by a woman, an Egyptian, a Jewish woman, by origin. But it, it's not yeah. just the attitude of yeah. Muslims, be they Arab or not, because in, many of the, yeah. in Britain, for example, the former empire, it's South Asian overwhelmingly. Yeah. It's also the attitude of some people in the, the elites of European society who are very comfortable with always taking the side of, of Muslim states against America, against Israel, against the West, against Britain, and so on. So it, it's um, a cultural and political spasm, spasm uh, plus immigration from Muslim countries. And it's a loaded term, of course, and I mean, it's quite offensive in a way, but... Um, there are some in the Muslim community who've, who've rather embraced it. And they, they do have aspirations that Europe should be a predominantly Muslim continent. I don't think it'll happen. Well, let's show the numbers here. Randall, why don't you take us through these? Everybody here in the studio, check the monitors. And uh, here are the percentages of Islam in Europe today. There's Europe. Let's uh, color code this map here and we can bring it up. You can see in the green areas, less than 1% of the population is Muslim. And then the red and the orange and the slightly less orange. And then I'm not even sure what that last color is, but uh, areas where it's... Uh, more than 80% population. France, of course, has the largest Muslim population of any country in Europe. And, Randall, let's ask the... Uh, the let's just wrong, actually. That Holland shows green. Sorry. Holland shows green. And it, it's 6%. And so it's six? it should be red. It should be red. <laughs> yeah, just to... Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll take your word for that. Yeah. Uh, Randall, the, the, uh, the uncomfortable question is, based on those numbers, is Europe at the risk of becoming Eurabia? <laughs> Well, I mean, clearly the evidence for the moment shows that you're, you're, through family unification, particularly, also through asylum seeking, you're getting large numbers of immigrants who are Muslim, be they Arab or from another part of the world, as Michael pointed out. And birth rates among Muslim communities are notably higher than in, quote unquote, uh, native indigenous communities. For in Germany, among um, non Muslim Germans or Germans overall, the average is 1.3, which is extremely low. So you're going to see a sharp increase in um, Muslim populations in these countries. Uh, to call this Eurabia is, is prejudging the argument. I mean, the question to me seems to be this. Um, if this community is going, these communities are going to increase, and if you're going to have large-scale immigration, particularly the unskilled, do you need to change structures in the labor market, in integration policies, perhaps in citizenship policies, to cope with that? and to sustain the sort of democratic values that hopefully everybody, including the majority of the Muslim community, supports. Well, that's and the that's the kind of intelligent element to the Eurasian question. Let me go to question. Mazin on that, and then I'll yeah. get some more reaction around the table here. Clearly, the idea behind this, Mazin, is that uh, some people are not comfortable with the notion of, because of higher birth rates, et cetera, this kind of, um, for lack of a better expression, Islamic tide coming across Europe, which will take away all of the kind of small L liberal rights that people have enjoyed for centuries. and impose some kind of Sharia law across Europe. That's the fear. What's the, uh, what's the likelihood of that happening as you look at it? It's unlikely, completely unlikely. I think once we have these issues of terrorism kind of calming down and, and people starting to get back to, to a, a thoughtful discussion on the issues, dialogue, they will go back to uh, the natural inclination of these communities. Uh, a Gallup uh, poll was done 
uh, not long ago uh, in Europe it, it indicated that in uh, I think in the 90s over 46 percent of French uh, immigrants or, or sorry Moroccan Arab immigrants to Europe believed in secular values and did not understand Islam in the rigid definitions that people are accepting right now there's a lot of these discussions that are happening right now that we need to take within the context of the global conflict that is happening right now, okay, terrorism, but I, I do need to follow Islam up, and all these things. I do need to follow up with this, Mazin, and that is you said it's unlikely. Uh, uh, un totally un unlikely. Unlikely is a long way away from impossible. And maybe oh, it's impossible. I, I'll, I'll be clear. It's impossible <laughs> because, because this is, this is uh, we're talking about a minority. We're talking, if, if you look at Canada, for example, we have the, the population of Muslims in Canada is less than 3%. Are we discussing that in Canada? Are we talking about, you know, Muslims taking over Canada? Not at all, because most Muslims are well integrated in Canada. Some of the most successful uh, uh, examples of integration are from the Arab and the Muslim communities in Canada. So we can, if, if these policies that we're following in Canada and hopefully we'll have a honest discussion about them in Canada are, are, are uh, used in, in Europe and in France and other places, I think this debate will not even be, uh, this issue will not be uh, uh, on the radar screen. Oh, Michael and then Anna. It's, um, it's a very different Muslim population in Canada. Uh, now, you can blame British immigration policies, but in Canada, you, you, you also have a large Arab Christian population, which has changed the, the nature to an extent of the Arab population. They're the same in the United States. I don't think there's any particular issue in North America at all, really. In Europe, it's very hard to say. Look, th th there are schools in Europe that are no longer teaching courses on the Holocaust because some Muslim pupils, a lot, have complained. That's an awful thing to happen. On, on the other hand, there are Muslims in the House of Lords, in the House of Commons, the Muslim MPs, Muslim politicians, Muslim in, 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 every, in every walk of life. I don't know. What is worrying, though, is that there has been, and there's ample evidence of a certain radicalization of young people. So it's not that the second generation, the third generation say, oh, we don't want that anymore. They're saying, we do want that. You may not have wanted it, but we do. Uh, you, you may see it in Canada with the arguments of a polygamy. With the redefinition of marriage debate that went on some, a couple of years ago, there will be a push for polygamy. It won't be the majority in the Muslim community. But there you will see the, um, the, the notion of, of, of a liberal interpretation of values, what is marriage, with the thrust of, of a, a fairly fundament, fundamentalist religious community. And how will we decide? Well, so the, the debate isn't over in this. The country. Muslims might not lead that one. There might be certain colonies in British Columbia that would lead exactly, that one. Exactly, have gonna... nothing to do with Muslims. I, yeah. I don't yeah. think it has much to do with a few rather strange people with beards uh, <laughs> in why, British Columbia. Why, Michael, why are they strange people with beards in British Columbia, and they're not, you know, uh, uh, strange people in the Muslim community who want polygamy? Because the people in British Columbia. It's do... not. It's not accepted by all Muslims, and it's not something that is tolerated. I never said it was. But the, but the people in British Columbia are so much on the fringes of Christian society or Western society. And it's very hard to take, find anyone who takes them seriously. And most Muslims will tell you that these Al-Qaeda types and Taliban types oh. are the fringes on, of Muslim community. I'm not mentioning Al-Qaeda or Taliban. But I, this is the, the, the mentality. No, but, but, but sir, Al-Qaeda and Taliban put aside uh, polygamy. I've met a number of Muslims, interviewed a number of Muslims who do say, well, yes, we should certainly consider it. And I understand what they're saying as well. Maybe we should consider it. But let's not pretend it's just a tiny, tiny handful. If you look at the figures, you, you mentioned the number of Moroccans who believe in secular values. Was it 46%, you said? Yes. Yes. That means the majority do not. That's a no, very no, frightening they, only twenty percent. Only twenty percent believed in in Islam as as a way of life. Forty six percent said no, and they and the rest of them were you know they were uh, un, unconcerned about it or disconcerned. Just twenty percent. Okay. Let me get Anna's uh, view on this as well. I think I'm sort of with Mazen on this in the sense that I, the way what the Arabia concept does, what it shows even in this discussion, it, is it unifies all Muslims under this extremist label. And what we need to look at and what we need to take seriously is that when people live somewhere, there are social processes that unfold. And most immigrants in Holland, most Moroccans, Turkish immigrants in Holland, for example, and elsewhere in Europe as well, move there because they want something from those countries. They want to have a life in those countries. They want to have their kids go to school. They want to be, have a, they want to be successful. And religion is to various degrees parts of their lives. But the Dutch Muslim population, I believe only a third of them is regular mosque attendant, attender. So you have... You know, to call these people Muslim is kind of like calling, um, you know, somebody who goes to church on Christmas a Christian when that isn't really a big part of their life. Gotcha. It, and if we keep insisting on the Muslim label, we keep, and then in the context of, 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 of other labels like Arabia, 
we keep discussing this potential radicalization, and I think the real danger there is the counter radicalization. That I know you're getting to of the like Geert Wilders well, and ultra right I, I parties. Yeah, yeah, maybe because uh, sensitivity is incredibly important, and mm -hmm. any, anyone who says all Muslims is mm -hmm. an idiot, and, and they yeah. should be disregarded immediately. But we, we've not said that at all. It's a minority of Muslims. Yeah. However, the damage that can be done if you speak mm -hmm. to the families of victims throughout Europe, people have suffered terribly, mm -hmm. and the attacks that, that aren't even reported in the media, mm -hmm. individual attacks on people by Muslims. The, the cartoon, uh, Kurt Vestergaard, for example, do, do you know why the cartoons were drawn in the first place? Because one of the, one of the main reasons, a man who merely read the Quran, a non-Muslim, to a group of students who were non-Muslim, not to criticize, merely to, to talk about the Quran, was kidnapped, tortured, and beaten up by a Muslim gang in, in, in Denmark. This was, th th there are reasons why some people react to Islamic extremism. Okay, but Michael, but Michael, we're not talking about yeah. the attacks against Muslims either, and yeah. we're, not atta yeah. we're not talking about something that is fundamentally yeah. problematic. When, when these cartoons were published, it, they attacked the fundamental belief system of the Muslims, and that is the no, problem. No, 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 no. No, no, allow me. I, 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 I think they should be published. Me, I don't care. Sorry. Let, let yeah. me, forgive me, I want it, because the, the, the clock is becoming our enemy quickly yeah. here, and I want to make, there's a whole f uh, additional chapter to our discussion I want to make sure we get to, and let me, and I don't want to read, debate the whole Muslim cartoon thing here, because we've, no, no. we've done that a lot. <laughs> it's an example, that's all. I Sorry. hear you, I hear you. Randall, this one to you first. I want mm. you to help us with this paradox here. Europe is largely seen by the West, I think it's fair to say, as being the height of culture in the arts, in humanities, progressive thought, and so on. Europe also, of course, has a terrible history of intolerance towards uh, certain Christian denominations, towards Jews, towards Arabs, towards Muslims, um, Muslims in the Balkans, now Western European nations. Can you help us understand why such a cultured place occasionally behaves in such an uncultured way? <laughs> Easy question. Uh, <laughs> I think you need to, to, to break these out again. And I think what you want to say is that the um, very liberal and progressive Europe that we see today, where there's an entrenched human rights culture, is the result of the brutality of Europe before the war, above all towards the Jews. In many ways, we live in the world in which the, Nazi, that the Nazis gave to us. Without the Holocaust, the utter delegitimization of racism, a human rights culture um, firmly entrenched in Europe, um, a great deal of suspicion of anyone who would demonize any community. The moment a Wilders comes up and criticizes Muslims, there'll be another three people who will say the th things that are being very reasonably said around yes. this table. This, they don't speak for all Muslims. Most are peace-loving. Things that need to be said. But that seems to be the relationship. And I, I must say, I. I, I'm not suggesting you were doing this, but this notion that the situation of Muslims in contemporary Europe is anything like the situation like Jews in pre-war Europe is simply absurd. On the contrary, they are enjoying the, they are in fact benefiting from the suffering of those Jews because it's because of the Holocaust then that we have a human rights culture now. Mazin, can I get you to weigh in on that paradox? Of course, of course. I, I, I agree with, uh, with what he just said now, and I think it's, it's not comparable at all to what happened pre-World uh, War or uh, what happened to the Jews. And thankfully, uh, that, that is not the case. Otherwise, we haven't learned any lessons from history. But what, what I'm talking about, what we need to discuss right now, is, is the issues of policies that are making this, the lives of people difficult rather than helping people integrate and helping people achieve what they've set out to achieve when they left their countries, and that is to live within a society that is, that is known for its human rights, that is known for its culture. And this is the difficulty that people, people speak of, and that is how can you balance or how can you juxtapose the, the calls for uh, uh, human rights and, uh, and, and uh, arts and, and culture. On the, on the other hand, we don't defend the rights of people, in, in, you know, uh, uh, Muslims, for example, or immigrants in Europe when they are attacked by, uh, by, by groups, uh, for example, right-wing groups, or policies that are discriminatory against, against immigrants and against yeah, Muslims, dependent. rather than no. uh, supporting no, the, is, the values of human rights. Yeah. This is the, the, the difficulty here. Okay, and I'm not saying that Muslims in. are doing a good job. No, I, I think Muslims well, have a lot of First of all, first here. of all, not everyone has learned lessons of history. Uh, take a trip to Iran, and you'll realize a lot of people there haven't learned any lessons about the Holocaust. Go to Cairo, and, and, Yes, and many Arab mm -hmm. countries, too, outside of Persia, that, that this, uh, this is embraced. This idea that Muslims are attacked and nothing is done really cannot stand, because in those, and there are attacks on Muslims. 
Uh, there aren't as many, I think, as some people claim, but everyone is wrong, and the police do their job properly. And if you investigate the, the police investigations in, in Netherlands, in Denmark, in France, in the UK, in Germany, they've been very successful. There are, there are entire police departments that deal with crimes against okay. minorities. But can you speak to that whole paradox between how Europe, on the one hand, can be so cultural and so so cultured, so progressive on so many things, but mm -hmm. yet so intolerant on so many others? I don't think it is so very intolerant. It, it goes through, I mean, what happened, of course, during the Second World War was repugnant beyond belief. Uh, but some of the most cultured people in Germany were some of the, the, the most active supporters of National Socialism was the, the Student Union, for goodness sake, and many professors are supportive of, of, of Nazism. But I don't see Europe as being intolerant at this stage. Europe is reacting. Look, there are certain minority groups. What you've seen in Europe now, forget the far right, they have very little influence. Why people like Wilders and, Van Gogh and the rest of them, they're saying the rights of gay people, the rights of Jews, the rights of women must be protected. It's not the traditional far right Neanderthal yeah. approach, and they're saying that the, that the group that is threatening the rights of these minorities is fundamentalist Islam. But let me follow up on the rights question. Anna, the president of France, says the mm -hmm. burqa has no place on French soil. Is that an intolerance? In my mind, it is. It yes, is. Actually, as a matter of fact, yeah. And I'm kicking myself because I haven't been able to find the source, but a French politician said, what will happen? French women will not be able to wear miniskirts anymore if these people get their way. And I think part of that is what's going on is, it, is Europe is tolerant, yes. Europe has a strong human rights culture, yes, but one of the big issues here is gender equality that's trotted out again and again. But while there have been great strides made over the last 30 years in gender equality, we're not done with that issue at all amongst the non-immigrant population. Mm -hmm. But what's happening is by talking again and again about the burqa, the headscarf, etc., cetera, um, we get to avoid some real issues that we still have to deal with, child care, uh, equal, uh, pay for equal work. Honor oh, killings. Uh, honor killings are actually, I could tell you a lot about that, um, yeah. are being dealt with more and more. And in part, they're being dealt with because immigrant communities themselves have taken the lead in Britain and in Holland to get those things addressed. And, not in and in France, too. Yeah. And, in, and France. in France, actually, yeah. the, the head so. of the mosque in France was totally against it, and he was yeah. threatened. Yeah. yeah. I got la uh, 30 seconds to go here. Do you want to weigh in on whether or not the French president's being intolerant on the... Uh, on this issue? Well, it depends on what you think he's saying. And if what you think he's saying is that misogyny is unacceptable in France, and if you accept the premise that the <coughs> full burqa and niqab uh, can only be the subjugation of women, then he's not being intolerant. So it's partly on that definitional issue. I would say in res response to, to Anna, on the one hand, I, I take your point. On the other hand, I don't see uh, middle class people not getting child care cases on quite the same level as women being. Um, forced to cover their body from head to toe. We're, we're going to have to let that be the last uh, word on this <laughs> subject today. We could go on for a lot longer. I hope you'll all come back and we'll continue this discussion. Uh, Mazen Schwab, good to see you again once again Thank in the you, nation's capital. Sir. Thanks for doing the program tonight. Uh, Michael, uh, on the uh, right-hand side of the table, how appropriate. Michael Corrin, uh, of the eponymously named Michael Corrin Show on CTS, his new book is As I See It. Randall Hansen, University of Toronto, Canada Research Chair in Immigration and Governance. Thanks to you two for being on the program tonight. Anna Kortevech. University of Toronto. How did I do with my Dutch pronunciation tonight? Thank Very you so well. much. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody.